Good morning. And good evening. And welcome to St Nick's at Home. My name is Gareth. I'm part of the clergy team here. And I'm Angelica. And Angelica, you uh, have been part of St Nick's for a few weeks now, or a few months now, uh, but I'm conscious not everyone will have been able to meet you yet. So for, for members of the church family and for those who are joining us and tuning in, do you just want to give a few details about who you are or how you came to be part of the church? Yes. Um, so my husband and I moved to Nottingham in January um, and we've been part of St Nick's since then and have been volunteering with St Nick's. Um, and we're looking into ordination at the moment um, and have just loved to get to know some of you already. It's been so good to have uh, Daniel and Angelica as part of the church family. Uh, they've already got so stuck in um, and it's really, really good to be able to co-host today St Nick's at home with you, Angelica. So thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, starting a, a series uh, where over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at encounters that the resurrected Jesus has with some of his followers. And so this morning and this evening, we're specifically looking at the story of Thomas uh, in, at the end of John's gospel. Now, we're doing something a little bit different this week in that depending on whether you're joining us in the morning or evening, you're going to hear a, a different speaker. So in the morning, we'll hear from Steve, our rector, and in the evening, we'll hear from Rob. Um, we're doing the same story, um, but we're hearing two different takes on the same text and topic. So looking forward to hearing from them later. Um, but we're also going to spend some time in some worship. And, um, and before we do that, Angelica, you're going to help lead us, lead us into that. Yeah, so I don't know about you, but at the moment I'm bombarded with bad news about how things are changing with coronavirus and how different countries are affected by it. And sometimes we can just get sucked in and jump from one article to another, getting deeper and deeper into despair. And in those times, it's really difficult sometimes to praise God. Mm. And we are encouraged by many Psalms to lament and to cry out to God. As for example, in Psalm 77, where the Psalmist says, my hand stretched out with weir without wearying, my soul refuses to be comforted. Bringing our pain and our anxiety to God daily is a faithful act of worship. In his love, God does not want us to hide any parts of our life from him, but bring them all to him. And when we understand the depths of God's love and his faithfulness to us, we can praise him, not because we deny the bad stuff, but because we know that God walks with us daily through everything. And even in times of suffering and pain, his love never ends. And so today we praise God with the words of Psalm 36, verses 5 to 9. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. And in your light, we see light. Let's praise him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, oh worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Song again, whatever may pass. 
Thank you, uh, Jimmy and Jen, for leading us uh, in that song. And they're going to continue to lead us in sung worship throughout our service today. And I found it so helpful to be led in sung uh, over the last few weeks. And to know that even though I'm singing at home on my own, that other people uh, in the church and in the community and across the UK are singing along with me. Uh, but it also seems like right now is a time where we need to be even more creative than ever in how we think about what it means to worship whilst at home. And actually, Angelica, you and Daniel have been reading a book about this, haven't you? Yeah, we have. Um, it's called The Liturgy of the Ordinary, and it's written by Tish Harrison Warren. And we've really loved it because she has really practical chapters in it, like waking up, making your bed, brushing your teeth, um, practices that we all do every day. Um, and just how we can connect those daily practices with worshiping God, with getting in, in touch with God. Um, and in the end, um, in the back of the book, there's some discussion questions and really helpful practices that can just help us with that. Brilliant. I absolutely love this book. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And so even though right now there is no shortage of potential resources out there uh, to help you in your walk with God or in following Jesus and um, over the next few weeks we really want to recommend this we want to we want to offer this to you as some recommended reading either to do in your communities uh, as Angelica said there are discussion questions at the back that you could use um, or in your own sort of in your own devotions or in your own uh, discovery and attempts to worship at home uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to send out a bit of a sort of suggested reading plan uh, you may have already received that uh when when you when you watch this um and over the next few weeks starting next week we're going to dip in and out of this book uh, and just highlight a different chapter uh just to help us as we read this together you will now hear from um steve or rob depending on when you're listening to this um and we'll also have a reading from gerald and anne Hi everyone, today we are going to be looking at the evening immediately after Jesus has risen from the dead. 
And in particular, we're going to be focusing on Jesus's first interaction with his disciples post-resurrection. And as you hear the reading, I want you to focus on what does Jesus actually say to his disciples in that situation. Our reading today is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning to read at verse 19, where Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi everyone, I hope you've had a great Easter. I'm guessing it's a fairly different Easter to anything you've experienced before. And as Church Together, we've been exploring the Easter story over the last few weeks. Um, we obviously saw Jesus on Palm Sunday in the build-up to him being arrested and ultimately his death and his resurrection. And last week, Gareth took us through the story of the road to Emmaus. And today we're going to take that story a little bit further and we're going to look at the first time that Jesus met with his disciples after the resurrection. And obviously there are only 11 disciples now, given that Judas is out of the picture. And my main aim today is to explore in that interaction, that first interaction Jesus has with his disciples after the resurrection, what does he actually say to them? And we're going to do that particularly through the lens of Thomas. You might know him as Doubting Thomas, one of the disciples. And one of the things I love about the Gospels generally is that so often you see Jesus interacting with people, often his disciples, and very often you can place yourselves in the position of those people with whom he's interacting and ask yourself, what are the implications for us of what Jesus says to them? And so that's what I want to do today. I want us to look at that first interaction that Jesus has with his disciples after his resurrection and in particular explore what does he say to them. Our passage today is split into two parts. The first part is Jesus meeting with his disciples minus Thomas, and obviously Judas isn't there either. And uh, the second part, Thomas is present. And so let's see what we can learn from that. I'm going to reread just starting at verse 19, the first few verses, and I want you to pay particular attention to what Jesus says at the start of this passage. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So I hope you notice Jesus has said three things so far to his disciples. And I'm going to suggest to you that he's made a statement about peace, a statement about purpose and a statement about power. The first thing he says is, peace be with you. That's the statement about peace. And he actually says it twice. Then he makes a statement about purpose. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And finally, a statement about power. Receive the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to pause for a minute and I want to talk to you about my experience generally of how those three things are linked together. Peace, purpose and power. When I was about 16 or 17, actually for, for a fair amount of my teenage years, I told people that I wanted to be a lawyer. And at the time, I didn't really have any interest in law. Um, but what I did have an interest in was the the wealth potentially that came with it. And uh, alongside that, the status uh, of having a well-respected career. And I think in my head, I thought that having that wealth and that status and the comfort uh, that came with that, and the security that perhaps that would bring me into a life of peace. And so in other words, I thought if I strive in my own power to do well in my exams and to get to the university I need to go to to become a lawyer, then through that purpose of being a lawyer, maybe I'll achieve peace in the form of security and status and, and wealth and not needing to worry about being able to afford things. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong whatsoever with being a lawyer. But the point I want to make is that my mindset at the time was this. It was strive in my own power to achieve some kind of purpose, in this case, career aspirations, to then achieve some form of peace. And I think broadly speaking, that's often the mindset of our world. Our world often thinks strive in your own power to achieve some purpose, to achieve security and wealth and peace that comes with it. And perhaps there's some value in that. I'd probably suggest that when COVID-19 brings the world to a halt, uh, maybe there's not as much peace through that approach as you were hoping. Um, but generally, I think that's how people think, I would say. And maybe even a lot of the religions around the world think in a similar way. If you work in your own power at the purpose of pleasing God, if you do that well enough, then maybe you'll have a life of peace in heaven with God. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because I want to suggest that in this passage that we just read, Jesus completely reverses that process. The first words out of Jesus' mouth are, peace be with you, and he says that twice. The disciples haven't had to earn that, they haven't had to do anything. It is a gift. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, you probably will have heard that phrase, peace be with you. And I'll admit for, for a long time of saying that phrase when we take communion in church, I've kind of had in my mind, oh yeah, this is a nice thing to say to each other. Peace be with you. I hope, I hope everything's okay with you. And actually when Jesus says that, it's, it's so much more than that. It is a declaration of the fact that through what he's just achieved in his death and his resurrection, then human beings can be at peace with God. They do not deserve any punishment, or they do deserve it, but it's been taken on Jesus himself. And so from the disciples' point of view, they possibly weren't even expecting that Jesus would be coming in peace. At the point where he was arrested, they fled and they deserted him. And yet the first words out of his mouth are, peace be with you. And that's before anything else. And then from that starting point of peace, they are then invited to step into purpose and power. And that is radically different to the way that the world views peace. It's not strive in your own power to achieve some purpose which will hopefully give you some kind of comfort and wealth and peace maybe. It is receive the peace of Jesus Christ before you do anything else. In fact in John chapter 14 Jesus in some of the last words he says to his disciples before he is arrested says this, my peace I give to you I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes and stands among his disciples and the first thing he says to them after his resurrection is, peace be with you. And from that place they step into purpose and power. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In other words, Jesus is saying, from that place of peace, go and be my representatives in the world. And, you know, for us at this time, that might look like a variety of different things. 
you might be in a position at the moment where you're stuck at home with young children who you're having to bring up and your primary purpose is bringing those children up in the way that Jesus would have you do that. Maybe you're facing a really difficult job situation at the moment and your primary purpose is persevering through that in the way that Jesus would have you do that. Maybe a primary purpose for you at the moment is looking out for vulnerable neighbours and friends and colleagues and seeing how you can support them and maybe even how you can share the peace of Jesus with them. And in all of those purposes that we might have, we don't do those in our own strength, in our own power. We do it in the power that Jesus gives us. Receive the Holy Spirit. Paul puts it like this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, the peace of Christ is the place from which all of the decisions are made. The further I went through um, my teenage years into university, I, uh, I became a Christian and um, actually God shaped my desires and changed my desires. And obviously there is absolutely nothing wrong with being a lawyer um, if your motivations are good, but God shaped and changed my desires and I ended up uh, being really passionate about teaching and I became a maths teacher. And actually for me, that was a real blessing because it was actually something I was passionate about. Let's look at the second part of our passage. And I want us to ask at this point, if we agree maybe that Jesus is saying we start from a place of peace in him and move into purpose and power from there. Let's see if there are any clues about how we receive this peace in the first place. And I want to suggest to you that there is a connection between seeing Jesus or being in his presence and receiving his peace. And so there is one disciple at the moment who's not feeling particularly peaceful or joyful um, because he has not been with the disciples. And that's Thomas. You might know him as Doubting Thomas. You could say that he's missed his community gathering. He wasn't with the disciples where when Jesus showed up. And as a result, he feels restless and he feels like before he can receive that life giving peace, he needs to see and be in the presence of Jesus. I'm just going to read to you from verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so next time, a week later, Thomas attends his community gathering with the disciples. Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas needed to be in the presence of Jesus. And as he sees for himself, he recognises that his Lord is risen and he receives that peace. And Gareth mentioned last week that obviously we can't see Jesus physically in the same way that the disciples could. Jesus actually gives a nod to that in the last verse of this passage. He says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so although we can't see Jesus physically in the same way the disciples could, God has ordained that there are a wide variety of different ways in which we can still see. We can see Jesus through his word. We can see Jesus through creation. We can talk in prayer, we can listen in prayer, we can see Jesus through his people. And I find it very interesting that Jesus could have appeared to Thomas on his own on any day of the week in between those two meetings that he had with the whole disciples. But, and I firmly believe that Jesus can and does meet with people individually on their own on any given day of the week. I find it powerful though that Jesus met with Thomas a week later when he was a part of his community. And even though our communities and our church services look quite different at the moment, they are still a place where we can experience the presence of Jesus powerfully. And that's partly because Jesus works through people and Jesus's people together are the body of Christ. 
we've recently started in our community a WhatsApp group just for people who want to read the Bible together. And we're reading through Mark's gospel at the moment a little bit each day. And it's amazing how much more you see and understand when you do it together with other people. And I think that's partly because people have questions that maybe you haven't thought of. People have ideas maybe you haven't thought of. You can bounce off each other. And as we see and understand more of who Jesus is and what his resurrection means for us, we receive his peace. As we draw towards a close, I want to draw your attention to one final detail, which is the same both times that Jesus visits his disciples. I don't know if you noticed it, it says it in verse 19 and again in verse 26, at the point where Jesus entered the house where the disciples were, the doors were locked. And I think John makes a point, John the author of, of this book, makes the point that the doors were locked both times because he's highlighting to us, the reader, the fact that locked doors are not a barrier to the resurrected Jesus. And for many of us at this time, we may feel like there are locked doors, there are barriers um, that are hindering us from receiving that peace that Jesus brings. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe maybe that's related to the current situation with COVID-19. Maybe uh, it's something completely separate from that. Maybe you don't feel like you have the community available to you like uh, I've described already. But I think John puts that in this passage deliberately to highlight to us that whatever barriers we might feel are there, whatever locked doors we might feel are impenetrable, the risen Jesus can break through those and bring his peace just as he did to the disciples. And so something to reflect on in response to this talk today might be, have you been viewing peace in the way that the world views peace? And whether we are gathering as a church service like this, whether we're gathering as a community over Zoom, or whether we're simply opening the word of God on our own one morning, the aim is to see more of Jesus. And as we see more of him, and understand more of what he's done for us, we receive his peace. And from there, we can step into the purposes that he has for us in the power that he gives us by the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening. I have heard it broken by them Overwhelmed by the way Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, and Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Oh, what?
got a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So depending on whether you're with us in the morning or the evening, you'll have just heard from either Steve or Rob. And really fascinatingly, they both had quite different takes on the same text and topic. And so maybe if you're with us in the morning, I want to encourage you to come back and, and listen to what Rob has to say in the evening. Or on the flip side, if you're with us in the evening, do uh, check out the YouTube, uh, the YouTube video of our morning service to hear what Steve had to say. Um, and Angelica, you've been particularly reflecting on Steve's message. Yeah, I found it really interesting and really helpful um, just seeing the evidence that Jesus has actually risen from the dead and that he is real. Um, and I found it interesting because I grew up um, in the church and um, came to faith really early on in my life. So if I've not really had this um, time of intense doubting as Thomas had. Um, and yet I, afterwards I've talked with so many people since, uh, since then um, who have had those doubts. Um, like my husband, uh, Daniel, for example, who's come to faith later in his life and had to answer some of these questions to see if he could really trust in Jesus. Um, so I found these um, points for evidence really helpful. Um, so thanks for that, Steve. Um, and Gareth, you've been reflecting on uh, Rob's sermon a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I loved uh, Rob's talk. There's so much good stuff in there. Um, in the first section about the priority of peace. Um, but what particularly struck me was something Rob was saying towards the end of his talk about the role of community in moving from doubt to faith. Uh, and I don't think I'd ever really thought about it properly before, uh, about how Thomas actually went on that journey uh, of doubt to faith in community with the other disciples. Mm -hmm. um, so this seems like quite a, an apt time uh, to tell you about the upcoming Alpha that we're running, kicking off this Tuesday, in fact, this Tuesday night. We're doing Alpha online. Um, first time we've ever done that, that's it, next. Um, and Alpha is really a way of going on that journey, that journey of, of doubt to faith, of wrestling with evidence, of asking big questions. But it's also a process that takes place in community. And um, Angelica and I have just been involved in an alpha group uh, quite recently. And one of, the, one of the best bits about that has been that as you have these big conversations, you also build up a sense of community. And, and it seems to me very apt because the journey of faith is always one that happens uh, in community. And so we're going to watch a little video just to give you a taster of what Alpha is all about. Yeah, I'm really excited for this. Um, and well, as we're doing this online, it might be worth saying that um, 
we won't be having food as the videos have mentioned and um, but we will have lots of community um and hospitality so i'm really excited to um maybe meet some of you and um discuss these big questions of faith together we'll now, now move to a time of intercession uh, and we have some of our nhs staff and um, care workers helping us um to get into a time of intercession now Hi, my name's Claire and I'm a nurse in critical care and I'm just on my way to work to start a shift. I pray today for everyone making decisions that they can make wise clinical decisions and continue to work together as a team. I pray for patients who may feel frightened and alone and for relatives who will feel anxious not ready to see them. I thank you for those patients who are getting better and pray for those who are doing so badly. Amen. Stephen Willett, I'm a GP at the Windmill Practice and also GP for the homeless. And most of the time, my consultations these days are done remotely, uh, either on the telephone or, or video consultations. There's a verse um, that in the message says from the Psalms, if I keep my eyes on God, I won't trip over my own feet. Let's pray. Lord, at this time of great uncertainty, we pray for all those involved in health and social care, including admin and management staff. We particularly pray for doctors and nurses on the front line who are themselves uh, afraid or uncertain how to act. And I pray that you would help them to act with kindness uh, and wisdom um, to bring comfort to those who are afraid. Let them serve as their worship to you and themselves receive comfort from you. Amen. My name is Daniel and I'm a social care worker. Father, we pray for safety for my colleagues and I as we come into contact with a lot of people. We pray for the vulnerable adults we care for as they've never been so at risk as in this season, and they've never been so lonely as they are now. We pray that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. Hello, my name's Sarah, and I'm a community Parkinson's disease nurse specialist. I'm standing here today at Nottinghamshire Hospice, where they offer palliative care services, healthcare of the dying to people in the community. Normally I would send my patients here, some of them, for day therapy, but at the moment they're obviously closed and they're now seeing people at home. My prayer today would be for the community teams looking after people at home, the people in care homes and at the Hayward House Hospice. And I have a big heart for people with dementia who are quite isolated at this time and quite bewildered. Father God, I pray for all of the community teams, for the care homes and for those living with dementia in the community. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we do pray for all the NHS workers and all the care workers out there from, from our church and from, um, from the city and just pray that you're really with them in this difficult time and give them the strength and the courage to keep going. And we pray for all those who are most vulnerable in this time, um, that you would protect them and be with them and that you would give the government lots of wisdom um, how to proceed with the situation. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 And before we sing our final song together, we're going to draw our time of prayer uh, to a close with the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Um, and Gallagher and I are going to pray this together. And when you, when you pray it on Zoom, it can sometimes sound a little bit messy, uh, but that's fine because uh, we're all going to pray this together and it is going to sound a bit messy, but it's beautiful when the church joins together in prayer. And so let's take a moment and let's say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. But, but deliver us from evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, power 
and the, the glory, glory are yours now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. You are the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you bore heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Who I could separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the realms all before you, silence the boast of sin. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. So the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.